The MiG-29, one of the most iconic planes in DCS, yet one of the least talked about planes. I noticed that there was a severe lack of MiG-29 guides online, and as the state of DCS has changed quite a bit since the MiG-29's introduction to the game, it may not be really easy to know the particular nuances of the plane. This video should act as a guide that will give you a good baseline understanding of how to operate the plane. If this is your first time here, this channel focuses on multiplayer sim gameplay, so if you're into that, please subscribe. Let's begin picking the right variant. The MiG-29 is part of the FC-3 pack, so by buying FC-3, you get all three variants. The base variant, the MiG-29G, and the MiG-29S. The only thing to note about these three is that the base model typically gets used in Cold War servers, the G variant is for West German use, and the avionics are labeled in Imperial, while the MiG-29S is the newest variant, and it has the capability to carry the R-77 Fox 3 missile and can support firing on multiple planes at the same time with its radar. In terms of multiplayer, these planes are essentially all the same, with the exception of being able to use the Fox 3 missile on the MiG-29S. Once you have spawned in, we will need to start it up. Here is where I want to flag the first peculiar thing about FC-3. You cannot arm your plane while your canopy is closed or your engines are on. You must do it before starting up your plane. So get in a habit of arming yourself before starting up. This is a good habit to get in with all FC-3 planes because this rule is constant across them all. Outside of this peculiar nuance, starting up FC-3 planes is a joy because there is so little to do. Right shift L starts up the electrical power, and then right shift home will start up both engines. The engines start up one at a time, so you should wait until you see both RPM needles reach this point before doing anything. Now for some particulars about taxiing in this plane, there are two modes for flaps up and down. Your flaps do not start down, but if you were to drop your flaps down, your nose wheel uh, becomes fixed and it becomes really hard to taxi. So just one thing to keep in mind. This thing is a rocket, so taking off is pretty easy. And it's FC3, so the gear controls are easy and straightforward. The thing though is that trim is very important in this plane. You will pick up speed fast, and your nose will have the tendency to nose down once you hit a certain speed. I find myself trimming this plane very often, so map your elevator trim. Now that we are in the air, we can tackle one of the biggest misconceptions of this plane. People typically say that this plane has terrible legs and it can't fly far. They are wrong. This plane has pretty decent range, but people think it has short legs because they mismanage the engines. You want to use the afterburners seldomly in this plane. The best two tips to manage your fuel properly are number one, is you can cruise with your RPM down to 87.5, your RPM gauges here. This will feel weird because it feels like you're giving very little power to your plane because your real life throttle that you have in your hand is being pulled back probably into the 40% range area. The second thing is your fuel gauge. The plane, this plane, unlike the early Cold War Russian planes, actually has a very useful fuel gauge. It will tell you your estimated range and it will adjust based on your engine settings and your altitude. You can start to burn and the range will plummet. And if you go to cruising speed, it'll climb back up. It's a really great thing, so just get in the habit of looking at it. Additionally, you should always carry a fuel bag with this plane. The center pylon is the recommended one because it won't take up a missile pylon. When the fuel gauge reaches here, then you have exhausted your fuel tank and you're free to dump your tank. There's a special thing with the fuel tank that you must keep in mind. You cannot use your air brake when you have the center fuel bag. Additionally, you can't use your air brake when your gear is down. So these are the two important things when flying around with the bag or coming in for a landing. Before we pivot into air-to-air -air engagements, let's just cover the other non-self-explanatory things in the cockpit. These lights indicate if you're in afterburner or not. This shows your AOA. This is your Mach number. Now for a very meaty part of this video, how to employ air-to-air -air weapons. Let's go over the basic weapon modes, which translate pretty well to the other FC-3 planes. One is for navigation, two is your BVR mode, three is vertical scan, four is bore sight, and five is your head scan or your HMD. All of these are important and we will dive deep into each one, but before we do, we should make an important distinction here. The MiG-29, just like the flanker, can scan using an IRST or thermal scanning system. And it also has its radar. You can turn on the IRST with this key map and you can then turn on the radar on and off. Turning off radar and using I the IRST mode is useful. When you are more in a stalking mode and try not to alert your enemies you are around, by coming up on their RWR. 
With that, the visibility you get will be less than your radar, so keep that in mind. So now that we've talked a bunch, let's actually go through an exercise to see what it looks like. I'm patrolling, I have my IRST or EO mode on, don't see any contacts. Okay, not a problem. I turn on my radar and I'm going to start to manipulate the radar elevation, which we can see on the far right side here. And we see that once I elevate it high enough, we see a contact that I go ahead and, and, I, and I lock. I now climb up and while I'm climbing, we can see the enemy speed and altitude on our HUD and it's right next to our own. This is great because this gives us an idea of uh, you know if we're gaining ground or not, if he's speeding up, if he's doing anything. And then we also see some weapon parameters or shooting parameters on the left hand side. The top box is our maximum firing distance. The second one is the no escape zone. Usually doesn't look, uh, they don't overlap that closely most of the time. And then on the bottom we have the minimum firing zone. Now that we're co-altitude, I go ahead and turn my radar off and turn on uh, the EO again or the IRST. And we see that we're able to see him with the EO, which is great. Uh, and I'm gonna keep the lock on EO and I'm cycling through weapons and you can see that the shooting parameters have changed because different weapons have different um, ranges and it's all calculates for you so it's super easy. Uh, you can launch radar based missiles with only being locked in IRST which is great because you can give uh, as little warning as possible to the enemy before you shoot and because we shot within the no escape zone and this is a uh, tanker easy peasy shot. The next radar targeting modes we will be spending less time on as they are pretty intuitive. The vertical scan mode is great when you want to scan a large area. If you hold down lock and move your nose over an area, you will pick up anything that is there. The scan area stretches up a little bit higher than uh, what is visually shown. I find this mode particularly useful when flying low and cresting a mountain and then flying to the side and scanning a wide area. You also have the bore sight. This one is probably my least one used, but I do use it. You can use the same TDC slew controls to move the bore around and by holding down lock, you will catch anything in that area. Very useful when you know someone is somewhere but not exactly sure where. The last is the HMD, or what I like to call head tracking. Basically, you are using a helmet mounted sight to pick up targets. This is very useful, especially for off bore missiles like the R-73. So let's make sure that we cover IFF. I am coming up behind two planes with EO on, radar off. I lock one and I'm gonna turn my radar on and we see that the symbol has not changed. This is enemy. Now again, EO on, radar off. We lock the other contact and we turn the radar on and the symbol has changed. This means this is friendly. Let us now go into BVR mode with the radar on and we see that the contact to the left has two rows, right? So that's friendly. And the one to the right has one row. This is enemy. So the RWR next, we see that we have a enemy plane that's locking us up directly ahead of us. Now, how do I know that? This basically explains everything you need to know about the RWR. I will do a video on this later and go more detail, but this is just a quick crash course. Now that I've hid behind this mountain, you see my RWR is silent. And I know the contact was ahead of me. So I'm gonna go off to the side and I will be pointing my radar off to the right using this control and you can see that the symbology has changed on the radar. And now that some distance has gone by, I'm going to go ahead and pop back up and see what happens. And hopefully, yep, so he's not dead 12 anymore. We saw that he's off to the right with RWR and I confirm visually. Switch to the HMD, lock him, and then go ahead and fire. RWR says a lot. Uh, with just a few symbols, which is really useful. I really like the Russian RWRs. The last thing is landing the MiG-29. This may be an unpopular opinion, but I believe that landing the MiG-29 is the hardest plane to land in DCS. I have more botched landings in the MiG-29 than on the MiG-21, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that I think landing on a carrier with an F-14 is easier than landing a MiG-29. This plane does not like to slow down until it does, and then it will drop out of the sky. Aiming for 270 kph is the most ideal landing, uh, the speed that you land at, and you really want, really want to flare your nose when you land. There is a p peculiar thing, which I find a bit tricky, which is that the air brake cannot be extended when the gears are out. So you will need to really take your time when approaching and do an actual real landing. I am pretty impatient with other planes, and I can get away just pumping uh, really aggressive turns while landing to shed speed and then land very fast. I can't do that in the MiG-29. The most useful tip I got with the MiG-29 is that 
you want to pass over the end of the runway just under 300 kph and then maintain a one meter per second descent while holding your stick back you will land at 270 kph and then you just let the nose naturally fall as you try to maintain a slight flare on your stick if you started this video as a total noob on the MiG-29 and have now reached this point, then I hope you feel like you know more and you have to, and you, that you've picked up some tricks and understand the nuances that uh, may typically trip up new players. If you found this video helpful, please let me know in the comments below. And if you are a seasoned player and you think I forgot something, please also let me know. The new players will see your comment and they will learn from you. Additionally, if you like this video, please do consider subscribing as it is the best way to help this channel. Thank you and have a good one.